Darkcast Network. Indie pods with a dark side. Hi guys, I'm Courtney. And I'm Lisa. And we are the hosts of The Book of the Dead, a true crime podcast based out of New Jersey, where we tell you about the most obscure cases that you may have never heard of. So join us in the Book of the Dead library for another chapter of the Book of the Dead wherever you get your podcasts. Bye, guys. Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker, or the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees, devil is on his way. Fall to your knees, devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees, devil is on his way. Motherfucker, you got- Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey, y'all, welcome back to Mountain Murders. Hey, y'all, I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. Hey, Dylan. Oh, is that country? Is that your backwoods flavor? Oh, it's just Heather and Dylan down here on the dirt road. In the backwoods? (laughs) Yes. Okay. You know how much I love to make fun of people who take the time out of their day to write us a one-star review, Dylan. This was a good one. Back, It was like very backwoods. And then they said we had some interesting opinions, one star. Right. I have to tell you, whoever you are out there, how dare you call me backwoods? We live in town. We live a block from Main Street, you shum We bitches. live in the middle of town. I ain't been backwoods for some years. Uh, I live in town. Hey, don't make me go back to the woods, you shum bitch. Well, whoever you are out there, with yes, we do have some interesting opinions, and uh, you can suck a bitch toe. That's all I got to say. Yes, and your one star is your interesting opinion, so there's that. All right. Absolutely. Apparently, I have a problem with geography, Dylan. Thank you for that. We have so very few <laughs> one stars. We have tons of five stars, four stars, lots of great, uh, great uh, reviews of the show out there to, I think, encapsulate basically what we're all about here. But we have so very few one stars, so I do appreciate that. So when Thank we you. get them, they're pretty funny. They stand out. They keep us entertained. <laughs> they do, Heather. <laughs> like, how dare a podcaster have an opinion? <laughs> oh. My friend compared it to walking into a marble slab creamery and being upset they sell ice cream. Yes. So that's pretty much sums it up. Yes, I know. So just to get in the mind of that person for just a second, it's like I, I, I access this free content. Right. I don't pay for it. No cost to me. It's free. I can enjoy it or not enjoy it. It's it's all on me. Um, And I didn't like it. So instead of going on to the other millions of pieces of free content out there, I'm going to take a minute and leave a one star. And it's going to be as simple as opinions, very interesting opinions. Very backwoods. Interesting opinions. Yeah. I guess that's their idea of some kind of a slight. But you know what? It's peaceful back in the woods. Uh, yeah, and I am opinionated and uh, probably will be till the day I die. So That's there's right. that. Oh, before we go any further, <laughs> I have to thank today, who obviously doesn't give us one-star reviews, a sponsor of today's show, a new patron over there at patreon.com forward slash Mount Murders Podcast. Emily is sponsoring today's episode. Erica, thank you so much for supporting the podcast you can support the show at patreon.com slash mountain murders podcast. Erica has so generously uh, subscribed, donated to our show, and she is sponsoring today's episode. She did. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Dylan, just to let our listeners know a little update, we are packing up and have plans to be out of here in what, about a week and a half? About yeah, 10 days. It's really happening. They think that some of our listeners may not think it's happening. I think some of the people who know us uh, think it's not happening, but it's really happening. We're, we're partly moved out of our house right That's now. That's right. I'm going to spend a lovely Thanksgiving, or I'm sorry, 
<laughs> I'm going to spend a lovely Valentine evening with my wife, and then we're just going to get in that rig and haul ass. What happened to Thanksgiving? Uh, you had done. me excited for a minute. I was like, oh, we're going to have a turkey? Oh, I'm going to feed you, girl. Is it going to be like a green bean casserole and oh, some gonna yams? A, a little tiny ham. A little sweet potato or something? For Valentine's. You are my little sweet potato, Dylan. Yes, I canned ham, y'all. All right, Dylan, are you ready to get into today's episode? It is a dark one. Really? Yeah. I Sometimes Heather discusses the stories with me. I have no idea what's happening this week, uh, per some, you know, per usual, some might say. So I cannot wait to see what you have in store for us. This is a family of shipbirds. Oh, God. It's like it's a whole nest of shipbirds we're going to be talking about. It's a damn shipbird nest. It is a shipbird nest. Once God. we get into the story... You're going to be like, what the fuck? You, you know, when you have a whole nest of shitbirds like this, uh, what happens is there's no one to check their shittiness. Like everyone's kind of reinforcing it and, and wanting more and more. And, and it just really spirals out of control. Would you say that's what happens in this story? Uh, to an extent. Okay, Dylan. So I'm sure you've heard the old phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. No, but sometimes it lays on the ground and rots. <laughs> Yes, it does. That's right. Okay. Well, thanks for that. When William Mansfield Jr. was born in 1956, he would be a chip off the old block. He was the eldest of five sons and one daughter born to William Sr. and Virginia Mansfield. In 1947, William Sr. was 21 years old. He walked away from the Wexford County Jail after an acquittal for sexually assaulting a 13-year-old girl. Oh, my gosh. In 1976, 21-year-old Billy Mansfield Jr. will meet the same fate. So, like father, like son. So, they keep being accused of doing something inappropriate with uh, people underage. William and Virginia married sometime after his arrest in 1947 because what I could find, digging up old records, she was previously married um, around the time he was arrested for that sexual assault back in the late 40s. William Sr. served in the Army during World War II, and at some point he was convicted of armed robbery in Nevada and given a four-year prison sentence. <laughs> How's this guy keep being in the wrong place at the wrong time to be falsely accused of crimes? From his early childhood in Michigan, Billy Jr. seemed to be headed for trouble. He was described as a child who cried a lot, plagued with emotional problems. It didn't help that William Sr. was an alcoholic who was also abusive. He often forced his sons to fight with each other and seemed to delight in watching the boys hurt each other. God, that's sick. So all I can think of is like, it's like bum fights, but with your kids. It's like gladiator school, but with your kids. <laughs> I mean, who, who wants to see their kids hurt each other? That's pretty sadistic. I think siblings oftentimes engage in physical altercations without your urging. I know a lot of parents who say, you know, they've had a couple of kids, they fight all the time, especially maybe uh, the boys fight quite a bit growing up or you got the, the, the daughter and the son kind of going at it a little bit. And most parents want to prevent that from happening. Right. You're not out there. Okay, now you square up. Now in the blue corner, I got my firstborn. No, most parents <laughs> are trying to prevent trips to the emergency room, right? We don't want stitches. We don't want broken bones. We don't want our kids beating the crap out of each other. Well, and even if you're not parent of the year, you, you typically don't want either, any of your children to come to any type of harm, be it physical or emotional. Now, Dylan, I was not really raised up with a sibling um, because I was 18 when my half-brother was born. So quite a, quite a big age difference. I didn't really get to um, fight with him in the dirt. <laughs> yeah, but, because it would be weird, an 18-year-old beating up a little baby. Beating up a baby, exactly. <laughs> um, now that he's older, he's bigger than me, so that's probably not going to happen either. But you had a sister growing up. Did you guys fight often, argue? Uh, we argued and carried on. Did but, you have a, any kind of sibling rivalry at all? Uh, maybe to a degree. We were a, two years apart. I was going to say, you're pretty close in age. Right. And I think the closer in age that siblings are, perhaps, the more they fight with each other. Right. And, and uh, when I was younger, maybe she uh, kind of bossed me around a little bit. But, you know, then uh, nature happened, you know. And once I did start developing into the unit, as I'm known in many circles, um, or a specimen, a lot of people use that word to describe me, um, I was bigger, stronger. So, you know, the physicalities went, 
you know, the way of the dinosaurs. There was no tussles between me and my sister because I didn't want to beat her up. You know, she's my sister. But she was bossy. Yeah. But I find you still enjoy having a lady boss you around. So maybe there's (laughs) something to that. Well, I grew up with my mom and my sister, and they're both strong personalities. So I don't know. Maybe you're onto something. Maybe. Maybe I need a mommy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've established that you definitely do. <laughs> you need somebody to beat your ass and put you in the corner, you naughty little boy. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I'll fuck you up. Oh, damn. Okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry, right. I'll stop dirty talking. You were on yeah, the podcast. You better cut that Someone out. might be offended. Yeah, you fuck around and get a one-star review. It's very backwoods. Virginia would defend this later saying, quote, I never raised a kid that run away from a fight. They couldn't come home from a fight. Now, I don't know about your parenting style, Virginia, but most people don't uh, want their kids to engage in fights. Uh, You know, these parents are out there, the ones that will actually take their kids somewhere to fight somebody. I knew somebody like that. (laughs) (laughs) That's about the trashiest thing I've ever heard. It is so fucking trashy. Like, meet me at the train tracks behind the, you know, save a lot or some shit. We're going to fight. Neutral territory. And then when people show up to actually fight, which has always blown my mind, men or women. I'm going to call my mama, hey, you give me a ride down here to this fight? Yeah, and for some reason, they always got like a toddler or a baby in a car seat in the car. So, you know, and then the cops come, and it just turns into a big mess. Sounds sounds very backwoods still. If you have to load children into the car <laughs> and, and, make, and make sure they're harnessed in properly and all that, maybe you should not go fight. That's all I'm saying. Despite this, Billy Jr. will later say that his middle class upbringing was good. William Sr. was an electrician who owned a business. Some reports say it was a refrigeration business. Um, I know later in life, he owned like an air conditioning repair service. Okay, so he has things to do with HVAC or some kind of coolants and such. Yeah, so it seems like despite um, maybe the shenanigans that this family engages in, uh, they did lead a pretty middle class lifestyle. Like they didn't really want for anything, always had a roof over their head. Right. They weren't in the struggle like the rest of us. No, and that does show that that's not those attitudes you're describing. We're kind of goofing around, but... These uh, types of attitudes aren't, um, they're not relegated. To is a certain a, socioeconomic status, is yes, that what you're saying? that's exactly what yeah. I was going to say. You can't buy class. You can't buy class, and I, I've seen it before. I've seen people with money. I've seen people without money. Trash is trash, and, and the way you act is definitely going to, um, you know, label you as such. Amen. Amen from the back row. Billy Jr. was a loner growing up. He was bullied and beaten up by other boys in the neighborhood. Billy was often in trouble with the neighbors. At the age of seven, Billy had a traumatic experience. And this seems to be, I guess, one of those uh, stories that I think had a lot of impact on this young child. Okay. Billy's grandfather had remarried a younger woman. And they had a two-year-old little girl. So, as Billy's a child, seven years old, he has an aunt that's a toddler. Yeah, and you find situations like this, and this certainly doesn't make you trashy. This happens in these uh, mixed families, blended families, if you will. Billy loved fishing as a child, and one day he went fishing on the river that was near the family's home, and that is when he discovered his two-year-old aunt floating in the water. She had drowned. Not sure how the child had gotten into the water. Some speculate that Billy may have had a hands-on involvement in the girl's death. Others say that he was forever scarred by this event. Okay, so some people think he may have had something to do with it, and some people say that there's no way he had anything to do with it because it forever left a mark on him. That's interesting. Right, so he didn't want to go fishing after that, even though this was like his favorite thing to do. He stopped you know, trying to seek out uh, fishing, didn't really want to go down to the river anymore. Like it really took a toll on him. And see, that's two very differing opinions of Billy. I mean, really is as different right. as it can get. The Mansfield's home life was considered violent and chaotic. A neighbor reported seeing William senior chasing one of the boys down the street, threatening him with a two by four. <sighs> Okay. Now, you got a lot of boys in this household. Yeah, and sometimes in those situations, it's, just, it's really rough and tumble. You know, you get a lot of 
scuffs and, and you know it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's homicidal maniacs or anything you just get a lot of uh boy energy and sometimes it's allowed to just go on kind of unchecked well it sounds like this dad is uh, checking it with a two by four dylan as he's chasing his son one of his sons down the street and, and that is now, that is abnormal behavior I was going to say, that's certainly something neighbors would remember. Yeah, it's not that every day you see someone uh, chasing their child around with a piece of lumber. No, I prefer two by six or bigger, so you can really get your point across. Okay. His first arrest came at 14 for petty larceny. Neighbors James and Ruth May recall Billy as a troublemaker. He was a terror in the neighborhood, often getting into trouble for stealing groceries, stealing car parts, Vandalizing homes, cars, and yards. Just a menace. Well, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And that is not. Now, you'll hear in situations like this, oh, boys being boys. That is not. That is inappropriate. You're not, you shouldn't, you should respect other people's property just like they should respect yours. And I think this is, uh, this is the type of thing I would never engage in as a young person. He was once caught pulling valve stems off tires along their street. And when the Mays marched him home to his mother, Virginia refused to believe that her son had done wrong. Virginia was described as fiercely protective of her family. She was most always in denial about any wrongdoings and was considered deeply religious. Her sons could do no wrong. It was always someone else's fault. Ah, this is a uh, classic enabling behavior. It's not good. Oh, this woman is extra, Dylan. She is definitely uh, next level, and you'll hear that later on. So when asked about Billy's first arrest for larceny, Virginia defended her boy, saying all he did was dig up a stolen piggy bank, which had been taken and buried by other kids. So not his fault. Not his fault. He's recovering lost treasure. I mean, what do you want him to do? Again, her son could do no wrong. As a ninth grader, Billy Jr. was accused of sexually molesting another 14-year-old girl as they walked home from school. Now, that kind of deviance is rare in young people in adolescence. This is very frightening. No, no, it's disturbing. There's no, no way around it, period. The girl's parents didn't want their daughter to go through the uncomfortable uh, trial, having to testify. So Billy was just given a stern warning by law enforcement. Well, yeah, and I understand where the parents are coming from in that situation. Well, you have to consider at the time as well. I mean, this was likely in the 60s, and people viewed sexual assault uh, very differently back then. There was a lot of victim blaming. Yep. And I'm sure this young girl's parents wanted to spare her um, any embarrassment and just uh, the discomfort of having to go before uh, you know, strangers in a courtroom and say what happened. And, and, and sad that, that this exists um, to a degree even in the modern day. And it's really sad how many times uh, a perpetrator could have been stopped early on or a victim helped way more than they ever are um, if we just viewed this differently or handled it differently. I mean, just the fact that the victim blaming even ever existed, let alone still kind of exists, is uh, it really just makes me sick to my stomach. It was after this that Billy dropped out of high school when he was 15. Using a fake birth certificate, Billy Jr. enlisted in the United States Army after lying about his age. Billy attended basic training at Fort Knox, then went to Fort Eustis, Virginia, where he went to transportation school. He was learning to drive armored trucks and Jeeps. In February of 1972, Billy was sent to Kaiserslautern, Germany. In less than a month, he was transferred to another company. He was in the Army for about 14 months before being given a less than honorable discharge. It seemed like as soon as he got transferred to a second company in Germany, they sent his ass home. They, they were like, he is not uh, conducive to, you know, he does not have a personality that is conducive to military uh, life. Uh, I'm honestly, uh, him kind of growing up and maybe rules not being, you know, a prevalent thing in his life. I'm surprised he made it that long, honestly. Billy Jr. had become an alcoholic while in the Army. 
He was no stranger to Michigan law enforcement either uh, because he stayed in trouble. I mean, from the time he was 14 through adulthood, he's just always into something. Detective Chet Bush with the Kent, uh, <laughs> the Kent County Sheriff's Office said, quote, this guy was bad. He was weird. Wow. He went on to say that juvenile courts were too lenient and that oftentimes Billy Jr. was, quote, back on the street before you finished your paperwork. Because even when he gets out of the military and is discharged, goes home, he's still a minor. Wow. I mean, he joined at 15. He serves 14 months, so he's probably barely... 17 years old when he's discharged and that's great and that's not why he was discharged if he had been you know more of a the more proper personality for the military he'd still be in probably michael mansfield a cousin of billy jr told law enforcement officials during this time quote billy's crazy he's going to hurt somebody he's going to kill somebody at 17 billy married a 15 year old named phyllis Now, her last name, um, I believe her maiden name was Nelson. Um, It's been reported as different things uh, in news reports, but I do believe she went on to uh, remarry later. And I think her married name was Spielmaker, but I think her maiden name was Nelson. So he marries Phyllis Nelson in March of 1973. Again, she's 15 years old and he's 17, so it's pretty young. The pair had grown up together, and when Phyllis was in the seventh grade, they started going together, Dylan. Oh, they were holding hands. You remember what it was like to go together? Yeah, you would go together for like two days, talking about your boyfriend and girlfriend at school. And then you'd like break up with a note or something? Well, you break up, or maybe one of, you know, one of their friends, or you know, were in the way, you know, meddling in your affairs mm. of the last 48 hours. Maybe somebody saw you in another hallway holding hands with your other girlfriend who lives across the school. She soon became pregnant and dropped out of school. Uh, Based on the math, I mean, I think she dropped out when she was about uh, like the eighth grade or so. Although she was like 15. So the age and the grades seem a little off. Yeah. I'm not sure if she started school late, was held back, what the dealio was. But um, anyway, they go on to have two children together, Billy Joel and Billy. Wow. Really creative. Phyllis described Billy Jr. as easygoing unless he was drinking. Once he was drunk, Billy became violent. Phyllis said during their marriage, Billy only hit her one time. While he was drunk, she would go to her mother's house until he sobered up. It just seemed to be a little safer that way. Otherwise, she says Billy Jr. was a good father who loved his children. He never forgot birthdays or anniversaries. Yet Phyllis describes an open marriage in which Billy encouraged her to have sex with other men. And she did. According to his wife, Billy was bisexual and would often bring home men from gay bars. And he would have sex with those men in front of his wife. Okay. By the time Billy was 18, he had amassed quite a criminal record and was never really held accountable for his crimes. When Billy reached adulthood, he had five sexual assault accusations. And yeah, well, that that obviously means to to me, it leads me to believe that you're definitely doing uh, inappropriate things. And there's no way that just because this hasn't stuck for whatever reason, I, I, I think you're doing those things. You're going to continue to do it until somebody makes you stop. In 1974, the Mansfield family relocated to Wikiwachi, Florida. <laughs> Florida has some really uh, wild names for towns and communities. Now, Wikiwachi, Florida is located in Hernando County, and it was incorporated in 1966 to promote a mermaid attraction. The town has now been uh, renamed. It's called Spring Hill. Ha. Huh. Now they're they're trying to promote the the small hill they have in town now instead of mermaids. Virginia said the family traveled to Florida by boat, which took about nine months. Her husband had a sailboat, and they sailed from Michigan to Florida. Now, have you ever been sailing on in like the residential, the citizen side of the world? I know you've been sailing on a Navy ship, but have you ever been on a sailboat? I've only ever been like uh, in the intercoastal waterway channels. Okay. On on a boat, like, but I've not. I mean, what do you mean residential? You know, like the not in not connected to the military. 
because I know they're known to have a, big a, sailboat divisions. A re- Do you mean civilian? Civilian. A residential? Yeah, I was thinking. I thought you meant like sailing by <laughs> houses, and I'm like, well, I have been to the intercoastal <laughs> waterways. I did mean civilian. <laughs> okay. Or the commercial side of selling. Okay, you know, we're going to one star. Dylan is special needs. God, I am backwoods. There's something wrong with you for sure. I don't know. I think your mama dropped you on your head or something. I think she did. I do too. It's probably why you got that big spot in the back. Don't make fun of my flat head. I got a flat head, bud. So I looked this up, Dylan, because I was very curious about ships being able to sail from Michigan to Florida. Okay. And it is possible. One route describes that ships can sail about a 1,500-mile inland waterway from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico via canals and tributaries that connect Lake Michigan to the Illinois River, which flows into the Mississippi. So I guess it is possible. Now, see, I was like, well, it ain't that hard. You just go out to, out in the ocean a, a mile or two and just go down. But you're talking about like an intercoastal waterways, which I think would be a really interesting way to do it because you would see all kinds of stuff. Well, this seems to be how they left Michigan and sailed to Florida. There were a ton of specifics about it, Dylan. (laughs) So I guess it is possible. And William Sr., when they arrived in Florida, traded the sailboat for five acres of property in Wikiwachi, Florida. Oh, that seems like a pretty good trade. Yeah, I guess there were some problems with the sailboat. A mechanic was like, I'll take that off your hands. Have five acres. Have five acres of Wikiwonky. In 1976, Billy was arrested in Michigan on a drunk and disorderly charge. Once released from jail, he was charged with a sexual assault of a 16-year-old girl from another Michigan town. He pled guilty to a lesser charge and was given three years probation. Neighbors in Wikiwachi knew the Mansfields as a wild, unruly clan. They're basically just a shipbird nest, Dylan. The five-acre property resembled a junkyard with old cars, trash, debris littering the place, a bunch of old campers, trailers, junk. So as soon as they get control of this five acres of land, they start piling junk on it, basically. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've probably known some folks like that before. Yeah. Yeah, I've known people like that. I've seen properties like this. You know what? I mind my damn business. I don't ask them what they're going to do with their property. Because you know what? It's their property. It's their property. Yeah. That's the the quickest way to piss somebody off is when you say, what you going to do with your property? It's it's already obvious what they're doing with their property, which is uh, nothing and piling junk on it. I know around these parts, up here in the backwoods, when you ask people what they're going to do with their property, uh, that is a good way to get your ass kicked. And or they put up a huge sign that says Hoochie Hut. Yeah, the future home of a strip club. Yeah. Yeah, well, none you is what you're going to hear. None you business. But then no one really wants to live next to a junkyard. I understand that part. No, I, I do understand that part because it can be a bit much. It depends on what your neighbor is doing over there. It can be a lot. But, you know, there's pros and cons to having unrestricted land, as they say. Right. If you don't want to live next to a junk car, then there's an HOA for you. Yeah, and then you're going to fight the power-hungry HOA president. I would rather go live next to the junk cars. That's just me. Now, Dylan, there were all-night parties hosted by the six sons, the six Mansfield boys on this property. I can imagine exactly what this party looks like. Neighbors described the boys were often spotted speeding, quote, doing about 100 miles an hour down Central Avenue. Uh, I'm imagining there's lots of bonfires, underage drinking. Uh, somebody may get, you know, sick and have to have their parents come before the sheriff comes out there to shut it down. It's been reported there was an old school bus on the property, which was the scene for many parties, sex, drugs. And rock and roll. Probably. I would say so. Some ACDC at least. Well, this is in the 70s, Dylan, so I'd say it's probably more like some, maybe some Skinner. <laughs> They're in Florida. Free birds, These son. boys probably love some Skinner. There was a steady stream of young people showing up at the Mansfield. The school bus had an old mattress just kind of thrown on the floor, which was used for sexual trysts, and drugs were easy to access. Sounds like people were doing a lot of cocaine, marijuana, and probably more. In the book, Where 
or I'm sorry, When Angels Weep, The Wiki-Wachi Homicides by author W.R.R. Langston, um, he describes how Billy Jr. would often cruise by school bus stops targeting young girls and offering them marijuana and booze if they accompanied back uh, him back to the property to the party bus. Hey, you want to go see a dirty mattress in my party bus? Here, smoke some of this. I, well, I might want to see your party bus, but I don't want to have anything to do with the dirty mattress. I can smell this mattress. It like, doesn't have sheets on it. No, it it's never had sheets. It, it has crusty. questionable. Somebody's probably peed on it. Questionable stains. You're not sure if it's Some urine or blood. Lips. Now, I, this mattress has been at every dump, open dump area where they found a body. The same mattress is there waiting. And you know, you're always like, why is there a mattress out here? And who the hell is laying on it? The Mansfields. <laughs> the man Mansfields. And whatever um, underage girl that they can scoop up. The book also reported that William Sr. would try to talk young couples into having sex while he recorded it. Like with a VHS or like a camcorder. God, it, does anybody or take... maybe in the 70s an 8 millimeter. I'm not sure. Does anybody take them up on these offers? Because there's some pretty sketchy offers. There was a constant group of young people, as I mentioned, kind of hanging on the property, just coming and going at all hours of the night, all hours of the day. As you can imagine, neighbors were pretty much over it. <laughs> yeah, it you gets got to junk be. property. You got these unruly boys hot rodding around, young people in and out, drugs. You well, know that, that there's some. Older woman looking out her window, telling her husband, Gene, I seen them speeding up a road again. I know they're smoking the pot up there. <laughs> now, uh, a situation like this really can affect the uh, entire neighborhood or, or, or area around it. And, and at that point, I think it's it's a bit much. And I think you're, you're certainly going beyond your rights as property owners. I mean, come on. Give it a break. William Sr. was well-known to police in Florida. He was arrested for disorderly conduct, firearms charges, assault, and more. Um, I think from like 1974 to 1980, the entire family of the Mansfields amassed like 66 different criminal charges <laughs> in the time they lived there. Oh my gosh. The isolated property is like something out of a horror movie. I mean, the whole time I'm like reading about this property, all I can think is House of a Thousand Corpses. Like, this is the Firefly family. Okay. Is, is, like, what the Mansfields are. No, and I think that's a good uh, a good place to start as, as you're visualizing a property like this. You think so? <laughs> well, no, I think that's perfect. You got abandoned junk, rusting out cars. You got just crap everywhere, some trash. And then you got this, like, cast of characters. Family that's, like, fucking nuts. Yeah. And one, just fucking nuts. One's crazier than the damn other one. And, and, like, you can't reason with any of these people. No. And, and the, they're always fighting each other. But yeah. as soon as you do anything, they're all fighting you at Absolutely. once. Absolutely. And then the whole time you've got the mama, like, blaming everybody else. Right. My boys is angels. They ain't never done their thing in their lives. They're good boys. They go to church. That's mama. So during Christmas Day, or the Christmas week, I suppose you could say, of 1975, Phyllis traveled to Michigan to visit her family for Christmas, leaving Billy Jr. behind in Florida. He didn't want to go visit his mother-in-law. So it's New Year's Eve of 1975, Dylan, when a 15-year-old girl named Elaine Ziegler who is staying at a KOA campground in Brooksville, Florida, with her mother and stepfather, um, goes missing. Lane and Betty Chalker reportedly went to bed around 10.30 p.m. that evening, and Elaine was headed to the camp showers when they go to bed. The Chalkers waited until the next morning. When Elaine still had not shown up, they file a missing persons report. At first, law enforcement thought the teen from Parkman, Ohio, was a runaway. Um, we know just uh, in our experience discussing true crime, during this time period, all missing young people were runaways. They just ran away. All of them were, right? yeah, but, but all their stuff and money and everything that they might take with them if they were to leave is here. That's how, that, they just left. They, they walked away. Yeah, everybody was a runaway. Search parties were organized with uh, the woods kind of surrounding the area of the campground. People were scouring for signs of the missing girl. 
Reports came into police that a girl matching Elaine's description had been seen riding on the back of a motorbike. And when asked where she was going, the girl said she was returning to Ohio. Yet a 16-year-old girl who had befriended Elaine at the campground told police that Elaine was seen talking to a man in his early 20s near the shower area. The man had invited Elaine to a party that night. He was driving a light blue 1966 Ford Fairlane with Florida plates. The Chalkers stay for another week in Florida searching for their daughter, and when they didn't find her, they finally have to return home to Ohio without her. Could you imagine? No. I was thinking about this. I mean, you're, you're on vacation. Yeah. Your child goes missing. I mean, you probably can only afford to stay for a certain period of time. You have to get back home. You've got bills. You've got a job. I can't imagine the stress and the guilt you would feel. Yeah, because like you said, you do have to, most of us have to get back to, you know, everyday life because everything's not going to take care of itself. But then you leave there. And I could just imagine that you feel so empty and hopeless when you have to leave the area where your your child went missing. But really, what can you do? You can't. There's nothing you can do. That's what makes it so sad. you got to feel so helpless and hopeless. Very frustrating. But the family hires a private detective to help find Elaine because, again, they feel like maybe police is not really taking it that seriously. They're still kind of considering her probably a runaway and you can't blame the fa uh, family for feeling that way and uh you know your kid you i mean you know what's going on in their head for the most part and, and i think you have a strong sense of whether or not they act up or act out and, and do things like actually run away because unfortunately that does happen a lot you know kids mad about something or think they can you know got better options somewhere else they think they're grown you know and want to do some some very adult thing like go away from the safety of being with you. But, uh, yeah, you know whether or not your kids run away. And in your heart of hearts, if you know for a fact they would never do that, but yet they're gone, and but then you have police and authorities saying, well, we think they've run away. That's probably what happened. I wouldn't feel good about the investigation at all. So keep Elaine's name in the back of your head, Dylan. I'm going to put it back here now. We'll get, we'll get more to that in a minute. So at 18, Billy was arrested for kidnapping two women. He was then arrested for assaulting a 16-year-old girl at a movie theater. He was given six months in prison. On January 31st of 1977, Billy pled guilty to sexually molesting a babysitter. Why is this cat not catching some real time from all this sexual assault and molestation? And uh, aggravated assault and all this stuff he's doing to people. Not long after that, he was arrested again for assaulting two teenage girls in a rural area and forcing them to, quote, perform immoral acts at knife point. At this time, Billy was sent back to prison for violating the terms of his parole. He shared a cell with 27-year-old Albert Lee III. During this time, Mansfield claimed that Lee confessed to killing an 11-year-old girl who was a crossing guard named Linda Vanderveen. Lee, a Houston, Texas native, drove a black Pontiac Grand Prix, which was seen by witnesses when the girl was abducted. On February 12th of 1979, near Orville and Rosewood Streets, and this is in Michigan, Lee allegedly snatched the girl, placing her into a car. Her body was later found dumped off a snowbank near the Regency Park Apartments. So in exchange for a lesser sentence, Billy testifies against his cellmate, Lee. And he is released from jail a year later. Gets a little bit of an early release. Yeah, I've never understood because everyone in jail basically is out for themselves. They want to be free. I mean, I guess you can't blame them for that. But um, I, didn't, I never, never understood people who... Um, brag or confess everything about what they've done to someone like this because there's a high likelihood they're going to use that information against you for personal gain and, and honestly you can't blame them phyllis divorced billy in april of 1979 when he was released in february of 79 billy returns to florida he's he kind of splits his adult life between michigan and florida on april 27th of 1980 21-year-old Sandra Jean Graham went missing from Pam's Liquor Lounge. Graham was a native of Tampa, Florida. She worked at Hillsborough Community College. She was recently divorced. 
Graham disappeared after being spotted in the parking lot talking to, quote, a biker. She left behind the bar her cigarettes, car keys, and eyeglasses. In June of 1980, a young woman goes to police with a terrifying story. She said that Billy Mansfield Jr. forced her into his van. And her name, uh, she's 18 years old. Her name is Pamela Cheryl. According to Cheryl, he drove her to a rented trailer where he physically assaulted her. He hit her repeatedly, cut her lip, and left bruises on Cheryl's neck. Pamela narrowly escaped the attempted rape by grabbing a kitchen knife, which she used to threaten her attacker. Good for her. Yeah. So after she manages to escape uh, with her life, you know, got a knife, finally gets, gets away from this fucker, she immediately goes to police. Billy, fearing arrest, asks his younger brother Gary to go to California with him. When police go to arrest Billy on battery and false imprisonment charges, he's gone. Billy, his girlfriend, Maureen, Gary, his brother, along with his wife and their three children, depart for the Golden State in August of 1980. Not, not like you said, the, the, all, the, all, this family mem- all these family members are into some shit. But, I mean, what kind of a partner to them are you if they're just like, hey, we got to load the three kids up and go on the lamb to California because my brother's... Once again, sexually assaulted and physically assaulted a woman. We have to go on the run. Now, I mean, what the, how do you even have that conversation? Now, eventually, Gary will send his wife and children away once they get in California. It starts to get a little bit settled. That's when he's like, I think I need to send you guys back home. Well, good for the kids to get the hell away from these nuts. Maureen, Billy's girlfriend, will say that she asked her father for a plane ticket back to Massachusetts because she wanted to get away from Billy as well when they got to California. According to her side of the story, Billy kept bringing men home, like men from work, men he would meet at a bar, and expecting Maureen to sleep with these men. And she just wasn't into it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's something... They definitely need to be into if you're going to continue to do that. The brothers moved into a KOA campground. They had a large orange tent and a dusty old camper trailer. I'm assuming they towed this camper from Florida. Yeah, unless they bought one on the way or once they got there, found an old dusty camper to buy. Who knows? And they settle outside of Santa Cruz, California. Billy managed to get a job at the Miranda Mushroom Farm and started going by the name Tim. Gary found work at Genie Electric and used the name Joe. So a lot of people in California knew them as Tim and Joe. Co-workers at the Mushroom Farm say Tim, a.k.a. Billy Jr., was spaced out most of the time and, quote, loaded. Oh, wow. He was never sober. He showed up to work stoned out of his mind nearly every day. And tried to stay that way until he left. Yeah, seems to be the case. On November 23rd of 1980, Billy was arrested in Santa Cruz, California, on the outstanding warrants in Florida. Despite his record of violence against women, Billy was given bail. And this is for the battery and false imprisonment charges. Okay. Where he attacked eight, abducted and attacked 18-year-old Pamela Cheryl. Well, yeah, they're like, you know what? I think they say third time's a charm. I say the 27th time is the charm. I think this old boy's learned his lesson. He asked his boss at the mushroom farm to help him cover the $1,700 bail. He denied the charges, saying that he had been wrongfully arrested and that it was a case of mistaken identity, that it was his brother who had kidnapped Pamela Cheryl, and they had the wrong information. So he really, like, was able to talk this employer into, like, kind of feeling sorry for him and putting up this money. Right. Just two days after this happens, he's arrested in California. Their father, 56-year-old William Sr., pled no contest to four of 40 counts related to sexually assaulting dozens of young girls, including one whom he had assaulted repeatedly from the time she was nine months old. This guy should be shot in the street. 
William Sr. was sentenced to 30 years in prison for these crimes. And, of course, his wife, Virginia, goes on the defense. She does not believe her husband had anything to do with this. Them girls, them little kids wanted my husband. They was the ones that was coming on to him. What is wrong with this woman? She's something else. Well, I mean, you see all this uh, just really inappropriate behavior, just as terrible things. It's not small-time petty crimes or anything like that. This is very serious, in my opinion. And yet, how can you just keep convincing yourself it's someone else's fault besides your husband's and your wackadoodle sons? Two weeks later, Billy and his brother Gary were at the Wooden Nickel Bar in Watsonville, California. Watsonville was a small town in Santa Cruz County, uh, located kind of in the Monterey Bay area. A woman who encountered Billy at the bar said he was, quote, an uncoordinated Okie prowling the bar scene. She just thought he was kind of goofy and he gave her kind of a bad vibe. Right. Earlier that day, Billy and Gary had picked up a new transmission for their van. They also went to a flea market south of Watsonville to sell clothing and other odd items to raise money for an impending trip to Colorado. Billy, Gary, and now Gary's girlfriend, a woman he had just met, uh, her name is Cindy, no last name. Now remember, Gary's married and has kids. He just sent his wife and kids away, but now he's, he's met a woman that's his girlfriend. Well, you know, maybe that's why he sent his wife and kids away. They were getting in the way of his new love interest. Right. So Gary, Billy, and uh, this Cindy person decided they wanted to have some fun at the Wooden Nickel. Billy Jr. had his eye on a waitress named Patty Schindler who worked at a nearby cafe. He had word that Schindler might be at the bar that night. Yeah, and see, Billy doesn't, when, and when he starts to court a lady, he doesn't worry about things like consent. You know, so it makes it really easy for him. At some point, Billy and Cindy left the bar walking next door to a liquor store to buy some cigarettes on the way back in to the Wooden Nickel. That's a great name. Billy spots a young woman leaning against a post kind of in front of the bar. The woman was 29-year-old Renee Salling, a married mother of three. Salling at the time was on maternity leave from her waitress job. Renee and her husband Raymond had attended a barbecue earlier in the evening. At some point, they had an argument, and that is when Raymond left for the bar. Renee bought a bottle of vodka. I guess she downed this before showing up at the bar looking for her man. Oh, so she's uh, feeling pretty good and pissed off at her man. She's especially pissed off when she walks inside the wooden nickel and finds her husband, Ray, at the bar with Patty Schindler and Patty's friend, Kim Powell. That is not going to improve your evening if you're that man. No. Patty had been dancing with Billy Mansfield that night, and she admitted to her friend that he had kind of given her the creeps, and she just wanted to be away from him. Eventually, uh, yeah, I guess after some words, I'm sure Renee exchanged some words with her husband, maybe his two new lady friends. Hey, bitch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it started out like that. It, so it sounded exactly like that. Uh, Renee was kicked out of the bar for being too drunk, causing problems. So that's why she's outside leaned up against a post. Oh, so she's her. already had this altercation. Yes. She's still probably steaming. There's probably steam coming out of her ears. She's mad as hell. Right, so she's all leaned up out in front of the bar. Billy walks by. He sees her out there. Billy offers to buy her a drink, but she turns him down. That's when he asked if she would like to smoke a joint in his car, and she accepts. The pair went to the car to smoke pot. Billy said Renee didn't know how to smoke, that she didn't know what she was doing, as she didn't know how to smoke the pot. She's oh. coughing. She's... Just not really doing what she's supposed to be doing with the pot, right? She don't know how to inhale. All those problems. It's like Bill Clinton. Yes. So he said she was, quote, a drag. And he returns to the bar and leaves her sitting in the car. She's very drunk. So much, in fact, that she's, like, having a hard time speaking. She's slurring. She's really out of it. So he's just like, honey, you just stay right there in my car. 
Well, yeah, and I'm sure she's probably, I don't know how fast she drank that bo- bottle of vodka, but it's probably she's probably getting more and more intoxicated as time goes by here. So back inside the bar, Billy has a conversation with a guy named Louie Luna, a man that he knew from the mushroom farm. It's one of his co-workers. Luna will actually be the prosecution star witness later when we, we get on to our story. Billy told Louie Luna, I have a girl, I captured a girl in my car. Okay. And then asks, do you want to see her? So a few minutes later, Louis Luna asks Billy if he could have the car keys that he wants to go play the radio in the car. But really, Louis Luna said he was concerned. Right. Having heard, I captured a girl. He didn't know what that meant and thought it was weird. And, and that's going to be most people's reaction. So because he that's says, a very... hey, I'm going to go listen to the radio. But really, he's like, I was going outside to check on what was happening out there. Yeah, that's not slang. That's not some term you might not understand what he meant by. That's just a very odd turn of phrase. And most people is going to give him pause. About 15 minutes later, Louis Luna returns. Uh, he brings the keys back. Then... Again, Luna asks for the keys, saying that another man named Pat Legg, they also work with this Legg guy at the mushroom farm, uh, that uh, he wanted to go out to the car as well. So both men go out to the car, and they describe Renee Salling as just being really fucking drunk, dude. She's totally intoxicated. She's propped up against the passenger door in the green Tornado. Um, She's just totally out of it. And Luna says he keeps checking on her because he wants to make sure she's okay. Like she doesn't seem like she doesn't seem like she's with it. Right. And he's just keeps kind of going back to check on her, brings his friend out. They kind of discuss like, what do you think we should do with her? Should we let Billy take her home? Like they don't really know what they should do. But around midnight, Luna and Leg leave the bar and they head to Scott's Valley. And this will be the last time they see this woman Renee Salling in the car and the last time they see Billy Mansfield Jr. Now the following morning the body of 29 year old Renee Salling is found in a ditch near the town dump off of Buena Vista Road. It was four miles from the bar and two miles from the KOA campground where Billy and Gary lived. This Buena Vista Road the route passes through both places. So Billy's not the sharpest tool in the drawer. I I can gather that from this. uh, Well, I already knew that, but I mean, this is a a good example. Um, You're you're showing, you're kind of bragging that this girl's in your car. Talking about you've captured her, told multiple people. They've seen it with their own eyes. There's witnesses. But then you go ahead and do some dumb shit like this. Renee Salling had been strangled, sexually assaulted. She wore one boot. Her pants were pulled down around her ankles, and her blouse was up around her neck. The woman still had cord embedded in her neck, tied with a double knot. Scraps of blue fabric from her blouse were found on the road, uh, some near the campground, but there seemed to be a third scrap of fabric that was torn from her shirt that was missing. The following Monday morning, Billy was at the mushroom farm working on his car. When Louie Luna sees him there, he nearly confronts Billy because by now he's heard that the body of a woman has turned up and he's thinking to himself, I saw you with her. He wants to confront him, but then he decides I'm not going to get involved in this and just sort of like walks off. Well, he's at work. I mean, I guess you'd be a little, you don't want to cause a big scene. You're, you're, but you probably also don't want to think that your coworker's a murderer either, right? No, I mean, no. That, and I agree. That's a, your brain doesn't even want to admit that even if the evidence is right there in front of your face. Late Monday afternoon, a sheriff's deputy got a line on Billy Mansfield Jr. and wanted to speak to him on Tuesday. Louis Luna had heard law enforcement was calling the mushroom farm looking for Billy on Tuesday. And that's when he decides it's time to say something. So Louis Luna approaches Billy asking, quote, what the hell did you do? Luna then proceeds to tell him that law enforcement is, they're looking for you, bud. They're heading here now. Ah, maybe you shouldn't have said that. That's when Billy said, thank you, and left. About 15 minutes after the conversation with Luna, Billy called his brother Gary, who was working at Genie Electric. 
Gary told the employer that his mother had been involved in a bad car accident and that he needed to go. Yet he confided in his co-worker that his brother was in trouble. So they're making their plans. To just leave again and go start this bullshit up somewhere else. Gary meets his brother at the campground, where they quickly pack their belongings into green plastic trash bags. The pair drive the van and the green Tornado to Sacramento, where they ditch the car at a shopping center. The brothers then drive the van to Nevada. That night, an all-points bulletin goes out through California, Arizona, Nevada. A patrol cop, fresh from a briefing, went out for his shift and spotted a van driving in Winnemucca, Nevada. The cop pulls the brothers over. Recognizing the descriptions of these two wanted men, the cop apprehends the brothers. And of course, they're denying the whole time that they are the Mansfield brothers. Oh, no, no, my name's Bob. But he's like, whatever. Billy, Gary, and the van. (laughs) I mean, they're arrested and they're expedited to Santa Cruz, California. Billy is charged with first-degree murder while Gary is booked as an accessory. Investigators found what they thought was a single thread from Renee Salling's shirt on a pair of corduroy pants belonging to Billy. Otherwise, there wasn't much forensic evidence in the case. Of course, in the early 1980s, forensics were a rudimentary science. At the time, investigators relied heavily on hair evidence and blood typing. DNA didn't really exist then. The district attorney admitted the case against Billy Mansfield Jr. was circumstantial at best. Meanwhile, in Florida, a confidential informant gave law enforcement in Hernando County a tip about a body supposedly buried on the Mansfield family property in Wikiwachi. Uh-oh. The tipster told law enforcement the body of Sandra Graham could be found there. On March 16th of 1981, Hernando County investigators began searching the property. The next day, they found the skeletonized remains of a young woman wrapped in a blanket curled up in a fetal position buried behind the house. She had a thick wire wrapped around her neck and wrist and her skull had been fractured. Well, there you go. I mean, you have another uh, death by, it sounds like ligature, maybe, strangulation. And uh, now this is on the property in a whole other part of the country. So that is not circumstantial. I think that's strong evidence. And can you imagine those neighbors around that um, Florida property um, while investigators are out there searching? And I'm sure it's a bit of, bit of a spectacle. Oh, it is. They and, are bringing excavators, yeah. tourists who... Uh, came to a wiki for the mermaid show, are starting to gather around the property. I mean, it becomes like a morbid death destination. Right. And I'm sure more than one neighbor was like, I knew it. I knew they was up to no good. However, the victim was not Sandra Graham. The victim wouldn't be identified until much later. A few days later, police uncovered another skeleton beneath the family's home water pipes. Evidence found in the grave, later confirmed by dental records, identified the uh, the victim as 15-year-old Elaine Ziegler, who had gone missing at that KOA campground on New Year's Eve of 1975. Oh, my God. They had so many chances to stop these people, to stop Billy. She appeared to have been killed by multiple penetrating wounds to the head. Investigators continued digging up the property, eventually finding two more bodies. One of them is Sandra Graham, whose cause of death was determined to be strangulation. God, this is like the killing field. You know, they're looking for one body or one set of remains, and they keep finding the other ones. It's, it's very disturbing. Despite strongly suspecting they would find at least two more bodies, without any clues to point them in a specific area, after five weeks, the search was finally uh, stopped. They were running out of money, funding, and also, this is a five-acre property. And five acres is big enough to, if you didn't know exactly where to look or you just didn't get lucky, you're likely not going to find something. In total, four bodies were found on the Mansfield's property. Two of the women police found buried on the property are still unidentified. One is thought to be a teenage girl who could have been as young as 13, 
white with possible African-American heritage, standing about five foot four. The other was described as a 22 to 30 year old white woman who stood about five feet tall. The skulls of both victims were sent to Colorado State University for forensic facial reconstruction. Both had been buried about two years when they were discovered. So they may have been gone uh, missing somewhere around 1979 or early 1980. Uh, and I, remember, he was released in February of 1980. See, like I said, they had a million chances to put this son of a bitch away, away from the public. And I've always been fascinated by the forensic skull reconstruction uh, models that they do uh, oftentimes. Sometimes it is way off. Sometimes it's way off, but sometimes it's dead on. Right. And, and they've I've seen this many a time be used to um, identify Jane and John Doe's because what better way than putting a face back to on the skull to help people recognize them? No, it's true. I mean, it's but one part. Sometimes I see it and think there's no way a person actually looks like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. What kindergartner was given some play doh? Right. right? Yeah, but this, I mean, it's this, it's pretty amazing. You've rec recreated this person to look like Mr. Potato Head. Right. Virginia Mansfield denied her son's involvement in the murders, claiming that the Hernando County Sheriff's Office had it in for her family. He, he's been running away from his last name all these years. As the excavation on the property, uh, you know, continued, Virginia lived in that mobile home along with several members of her family while they're digging up bodies from her yard. And she's still denying that her family, that her son has anything to do with this, and she still refuses to believe that her husband's a pedophile. Right. They're, they're planning these bodies they are. that they're digging up. Following the discovery of the skeletal remains on the property, the trial ends up being moved to San Rafael, California, because there had been a lot of publicity. So the, someone's, uh, the defense likely is put in for a change of venue. Sometimes it's just done without anyone making a motion, just because they know it's been a big hoopla. Well, especially when you've got someone on trial for murder and you find four more bodies on their property. Yeah, that's going to make it to the news. At trial, mentions of Billy's previous criminal exploits, along with eyewitness accounts, are recalled. Yet the jury was deadlocked and a new trial was ordered. Well, you know, we weren't subjected to all the evidence and, and that the jury was put through and saw. So I guess I can't really I can't really say if they did the wrong or right thing there. Well, one of the items uh, that baffled the jury was the pair of corduroy pants that belonged to Billy. And they found a, a thread that matched the threads in Renee Salling's blouse. On the okay, pants. the blue blouse. Yes. So this pair of corduroy pants, that's like one of the only pieces of evidence they have. But when they get Billy to try the pants on in court, they no longer fit him. Oh, gosh. They're, much. they're small. And uh, he's saying, oh, well, these don't fit me. The corduroys don't they fit. Don't, you must have quit. quit. Exactly. But the prosecutor point, pointed out the fact that he had gained like 14 to 15 pounds while he was in jail awaiting trial. That's irrelevant, you son of a bitch. Man, every time you put corduroys on, you're like, whew, 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 as you're walking down like the hallway. It's a lot of friction there. A lot of friction, man. I can't wear corduroys because I got them thick thighs, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I will fuck around and start a friction fire. On October 27th of 1981, Billy Mansfield Jr. and another inmate, Ben Berrigan, managed to escape from jail by climbing on a roof and jumping to freedom from the the yard. They just out in the yard and decided to climb up on a roof and escape. I've been jumping off roofs all my life, fellas. We're going to make it, and we're going to be okay. So Billy's escape was short-lived. A woman spotted the two men in orange jumpsuits running down the street. Now, initially, <laughs> she was like, oh, it's just some joggers, but then realized, wait a minute, they're wearing matching orange jumpsuits. Yeah. Yeah. She just thought they were fashion-forward for a she moment. She calls the police. So after 11 hours of searching, police and canines locate Billy at Paradise Park, hiding in some bushes and still wearing his little inmate, his little jumpsuit. Dude, that's like you pass a prison a lot. Even if it's just a two-lane, there'll be signs like... Don't, don't pick up hitchhikers. Don't pick up hitchhikers in, in orange jumpsuits with DOC on the back of them. <laughs> no, there's a specific stretch of road when we're driving up to Michigan. Yes. To... to see my son in Ann Arbor 
where there's a sign that says like, don't, there's a prison, don't pick up hitchhikers. Right. And I'm like, I wouldn't pick up a hitchhiker anyway. No, irregardless. <laughs> Stop. Of its proximity. It's not a real word. To a prison. One star uses incorrect vocabulary words. <laughs> uses uh, non-words that are actually words now. It's not so a word. Off. It wouldn't be a word if you'd stop saying it. It's not just me, it other is, people. Well, it's my pet peeve. Stop. Anywho, I'm never going to pick up hitchhikers because I just don't, I don't trust anybody. I only trust myself. Berrigan was arrested shortly after as well. Uh, both men were remanded to custody. So while awaiting trial in Santa Cruz, Hernando County indicted Billy Mansfield Jr. for one of the murders in Florida. He is also charged with sexual battery in the Pamela Sherrill case. So his new trial is set for February 8th of 1982. And by now, Gary Mansfield, Billy's brother, agrees to testify against him. Wow. In exchange for, you know, immunity, that accessory charge uh, that, dropped. But that, that's right. I don't want to ever get sick again, you sons of bitches, after I testify for y'all. Yes. Y'all going to give me that immunity, right? Yeah. He's going to get an extra dose of elderberry, yes. Okay. Gary told everyone at trial that in 1980, Billy confessed to burying bodies on his parents' property in Wikiwachi, Florida. Gary said he never saw his brother kill anyone, but mentioned there were several times he found his brother on the property bloody and that sometimes Billy spoke of murder. While he's holding a shovel. So he started to wonder. <laughs> yes. He testified that five years earlier, Gary arrived at the family's acreage and heard a howling sound coming from the backyard. When he went Around the house to check out the noise, Billy was walking toward the house wearing a bloody shirt and that he had fresh scratches on his arms. When Gary asked what was going on, Billy told him it was none of his damn business. Ah, yes. And you know, Gary's a piece of shit. And Gary said he seemed angry at the time. Because it's not like he's coming forward with this because he, he found it out and he can't live with what his brother's done. He's just trying to keep himself out of trouble. So if he had never gotten brought in by law enforcement or charged with anything, he would have never come off with this information. He told another story of finding Billy outside with a nude woman and a dog. Billy was holding the woman at knife point, trying to force her to perform, quote, an unnatural act. And I don't know what that means. Was it an unnatural act with Billy, with the dog? I don't know. All I can imagine is this poor naked woman being threatened by this maniac. Well, the woman calls out to Gary for help, and Gary says he took the woman away. He wrapped her in a blanket and then drove her 17 miles to a Brooksville bar where he dropped her off. Phyllis, Billy's ex-wife, was brought in to testify as well. She recounted that after visiting her mother in Grand Rapids during the Christmas holiday of 1975, uh, that upon return, Terry Mansfield, Billy's younger brother, told her that he had helped Billy bury a body on the family's property. She said, quote, Terry said he saw the body in the trunk of a car. He said it was tied with a rope. Terry also went on to say that Billy was incredibly drunk, and that's why he had to help him with this body. He wasn't in no shape to dig a shallow grave. I can go ahead and tell you that right now. He wasn't going to get it done. Phyllis also testified that once, while driving in a vehicle together, Billy told Phyllis and his mother, Virginia, that he had murdered someone. Initially, Phyllis was afraid to tell anybody. She said, quote, I just didn't believe it, I guess. I was afraid to say anything. However, Virginia Mansfield spoke to the St. Petersburg Times about Phyllis's testimony, saying, quote, She's nuts. I think she must have imagined some things. She also went on to say that her son Terry was, quote, just a kid in January of 1976. What she says is not true. <sighs> this woman, she's delusional. Yes. I mean, I mean, what other evidence do you want? I mean, this woman could watch her sons or her family kill someone in front of her. He's a good her. boy. And she'd be like, hey, they just... Uh, Rambunctious. They had it coming. It's just boys being boys, you know. The, they were asking for it. My boy didn't do anything. They were asking for it. My boy didn't do a damn thing. Not a damn thing. Not a damn thing. Now, this woman's next level. And the sad part is, Dylan, there are 
parents like this out in the world. They will never admit that their child is capable of any wrongdoing. And that's honestly probably one of the reasons why he's so fucked up because he's been enabled and they've made excuses for him his whole life. It certainly is, uh, yeah, certainly never got checked. He never uh, was forced to seek help of any sort. And, uh, yeah, I think their parent, his parents' attitudes certainly made him worse. They enabled him to continue to never take responsibility for his actions of any sort, big or small. Well, you've got Dad, who's a pedophile and a, a rapist and a sexual predator, uh, who sounds like a total piece of shit, has been in trouble with the law all these years, burglary, armed robbery. Assault, sexual assault. Yes. And then you got the mama who's like, ain't nobody ever done nothing wrong. My kids are angels and my husband's perfect. Right. So how fucked up? All right, excuse me, ma'am. We just found another body under where you're standing there. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. That, mm -mm. That No, you did not. Them was hamsters. Them was some hamsters. The boys didn't. I've actually, I've known some parents who were kind of like this with their kids. Just refused it didn't matter what their kids did, just refused to believe that their children had ever done wrong. Yeah, yeah. I've known of people like this before, too. And uh, they were just so far down that road of enabling and, and, and always blaming others and never holding their own uh, offspring to account. I don't get it. After a two-week-long trial, Billy Mansfield Jr. was convicted in Renee Salling's murder. He was given 25 years to life. Billy pled guilty to the four Florida murders and was given four life terms as part of a plea bargain. The fact that they're still plea bargaining with somebody like this. He needs to be killed. Period. Billy Mansfield Jr. learned that planting corpses in the backyard is risky business. While some serial killers go to great lengths to dispose of bodies, uh, I thought about Joel Rifkin. I mean, he drove all the way to, you know, a different state to do so. You've got guys like Mansfield that are content to just bury the bodies in their backyard. I guess never thinking that I might get caught. Well, no, he never thinks that because he hasn't got caught yet. He's never paid for anything he's done. Gary told investigators there might be more bodies near a sinkhole in High Point, Florida, near State Road 50. But uh, they've never gone out to excavate that area. Well, that would be a a rather treacherous and tricky uh, place to actually investigate, given uh, unstable ground. You never know how big the sinkhole is or any of that. Gary's... And Billy's cousin, uh, another Mansfield, claimed that he lived near uh, some water in Florida and that Billy often would show up unannounced or uninvited kind of in the middle of the night and would drive down to the water and seemed like he was getting something out of the trunk and throwing it in the water before he would come to the house. So again, got another relative saying there could be bodies out in the water near my property. No, it doesn't surprise me that there's uh, many more victims that we don't know about. That wouldn't surprise me one bit. But our story doesn't end there, Dylan. In October of 2020, Gary Mansfield was arrested at the Wikiwachi property, now Spring Hill property, for drug possession. Because, yes, the whole Mansfield clan still lives on those five acres, seems. During their investigation, Gary offered up more information to law enforcement, stating that there were more bodies on the property, more than the four discovered back in 1981. Again, he's not coming forward with this information because he can't handle it or he just wants to do the right thing. He's waiting to use these bodies or any of this type of information as a bargaining chip when he gets in trouble, and that just makes him a shitty person too. The remains of Teresa Phil and Jim were finally found and named. It wouldn't be until July of 2022 using genealogy, um, genetic genealogy testing, that 16-year-old Teresa Phil and Jim was identified as one of the victims. She had gone missing on May 16th of 1980 after going to a job interview. Teresa was never seen again. She was just one week shy of her 17th birthday. Phil and Jim was reported missing to the Tampa police by her sister, Margaret Johns, on May 16th of 1980. 
Johns kept in close contact with cold case detectives from Hernando County after they approached her in 2020 asking for a DNA sample. About six weeks later, the sample came back positive. She said, quote, it gives me peace because I know I didn't lose that she was taken. That I didn't lose her. She was taken. She added, the sad part is that my whole family never knew what happened to her. My dad died without knowing. My mom died without knowing. My sister died without knowing. She hoped sharing her story would encourage other families who may be looking for closure to not give up hope. So sad. So they found two more bodies on the property there after they start digging in 2020. So here's another Here's another murder, Dylan. Oh, my God! On March 23rd of 1980, Billy Mansfield Jr. kidnapped Carol Lee Barrett from the Treasure Island Motel in Daytona Beach Shores. Barrett was visiting from Zanesville, Ohio during spring break of 1980. Around 2 a.m., an armed man busted up in the motel room attempting to rob Carol and her friends. To keep her friends safe, Carol agreed to go with the stranger this man. Wow, how brave. After interviewing Barrett's friends, the detectives were able to develop a sketch of the suspect. A day later, on March 24th of 1980, Barrett's body was found in a ditch along I-95 near Pecan Park Road in Jacksonville. A medical examiner would determine that Carol was shot in the back of the head with a small caliber handgun. The death was ruled a homicide with the Jackson County Sheriff's Office and Daytona Beach Shores Police investigating. However, the case soon went cold, and in August of 2017, after reviewing evidence, the cold case was reopened. In 2020, detectives were led to a person of interest and identified Billy Mansfield Jr. as the suspect in Barrett's murder. He was 24 years old at the time. After multiple interviews over a period of two years, Mansfield finally admitted that he was the person who kidnapped and killed Carol Barrett. So here you have the third generation of shitbird. Now, would you, is this stuff hereditary? Well, I guess he's a second generation shitbird, right? Because you got the dad's a shitbird and then the son's a shitbird. Two generations, Dylan. So do you think these behaviors are hereditary or uh, learned or a combination of both? Well, again, it's that age old argument. Is it nature versus nurture? I honestly think it is both. I think, I it's, think a, it's both. I think it's a combination of both. If you're raised by some crazy, you know, or unstable person rather uh, like this and, and you're around all this chaos and violence and you, you grow up thinking it's normal. In July of 2023, Terry Mansfield, Billy Jr. and Gary's younger brother, was arrested for committing sexual battery on a child. God. And he's arrested at his Spring Hill home located at 7239 Centerwood Avenue, the family's five-acre compound. Oh, my God. These people. These people are ridiculous, and they're nothing but a, a, a menace to the entire area. Of course, this home is the infamous site where multiple young women were found buried in the 80s and again in 2020. So this was not Terry's first brush with law enforcement. In 2005, Terry was arrested on charges of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon against a man named David Bell. Terry struck David Bell with a truck after David was fighting with his brother, Gary Mansfield. So he is, from what I gather, um, still awaiting trial. Oh, my God. From this arrest back in July for being a predator, a child predator. And, and see, they... Like ne- father, like son. They were never like, oh, we, have, we need to... M- a lot of people would move from this property once there's been multiple bodies discovered. You've had all this um, accusations against your family, or whether you believe they're true or not. A lot of people would just move on to get all this behind them. But not these people. They're going to stay there until the last breath. Every single one of them. In the five-acre compound. Ain't a nary one of them moved off and moved on, right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so William Sr., uh, served 10 years of that 30-year sentence for being a child molester and was released. So he was back on the streets to do who knows what. From what I gather, Virginia passed away, I believe, in 2018. And William Sr., I believe, has also passed away. I believe Jesus. in maybe 2020. But this is just like a... Fa- it's a nest of crime and, and shitbird 
shitbird behavior or shitbirdery, Dylan? Well, to the tenth degree. I mean, these are this is violent. This is murder, assault, rape, molestation. These are all the bad ones. I mean, I just don't get it, and I just don't get how you can get thirty years for uh, inappropriate acts or whatever with the molestations of a, of a minor and of get ma- out. Of multiple minors. Of multiple, 40 counts. He, and, and the plea was you plead guilty to four of 40 counts. Yes. And, and we'll give you this 30-year sentence and we're only going to make you do a third of that. When the youngest victim was nine months old. <laughs> I just don't know. I don't understand it. I don't understand these. Uh, sometimes I don't understand how. I, I know I understand why they plea out and stuff, but I just don't know how some of these prosecutors and such can live with these things i mean i really don't know how you let someone like that have a chance of getting out ever let alone in 10 years or less and and you think that's justice that's not justice for even one of his victims jesus i mean is it intentional i mean we hear this story time after time you have these and it's always it seems to always be with rapists and molesters they keep having brushes with the law. They keep getting probation. They keep getting pled down. They keep getting out. Yeah, but you and, get caught with drugs. Yeah. You and, get caught with some drugs. Right. And you're going to go to prison forever. And do all your time. But if you... Rape, molest, have 40, assault. 40 counts of, of child sexual battery, then uh, we're going to let you out of prison. It's like they want these people on the street. I mean, it seems intentional. It I mean, seems intentional. It's very weird, and, and this type of thing is what keeps some conspiracy theories alive in our society. Is like it, it, the only way this makes sense is if it's in uh, you're doing it on purpose because there's you've had a million chances to stop this person from harming anyone else, at least outside of a prison setting. <sighs> So, well, and that's at least why Billy you, Jr. is still in prison. He's incarcerated in California, and uh, hopefully the scumbag's just going to die there. Yeah, hopefully, but every day he lives in prison, to me, is a slap in the every victim of his face. So I think he should be died today. I would do it. If they let me do it, I'd go do it. I'd put him down. You're going to be the executioner? Yeah, I will. I, you, won't even, I don't even need a hood, bro. I was going to say, you could have that job back in the day. I could have. You've got the body for it. (laughs) Oh, yeah? Yeah. Big shoulders. Yeah. I could wield the axe. Yes. Could drop a guillotine on somebody. Such an interesting history on the executioners, if you ever look into that, and how they actually live their lives. And people weren't real happy to see them come around, you know, because they're there to do do justice. Yeah, that's why Tom Petty wrote that song, Don't Come Around Here No More. Is that really true? No, but oh, you that believe, dude, but, you, so you believe me for a minute there. <laughs> I was like, dude, that song makes <laughs> sense now. I was wondering who you didn't want to come around. It's the damn executioner. Yeah, it's true. Right, because he's protecting that one innocent person that might get executed. You know uh, who else people don't want to see coming around? Who? Uh, the person that's calling you about your car's extended warranty. Oh, God. I'm glad that settled down. I'm thinking maybe they're going to start knocking on the doors. Well, you know, at least the extent we're trying to contact you about your car's extended warranty one was kind of funny. Now I just get like a bunch of robocalls with just nothing, and it's like a computer, and you say hello, and then there's a hesitation, and then it either hangs up on you or someone starts talking their little spill, and they won't listen to a word you got to say edgewise. And uh, then finally you're like, look, I don't know what, what – I'm not interested in your wares. Okay, so you can go sell it somewhere else. Peddle those elsewhere. But I never even know what the hell they're trying to get me to do. It's like, how do you make money with this? I don't know. I do not understand how there's any money generated with this cold call, robo call BS that happens nowadays. And I know for a fact all the phone companies and telecommunication companies could stop this in a heartbeat. Just a little bit of software, bud. Dylan, you asked last episode or one of the last episodes, I think it might have been the uh, big old trash salad episode, about someone who worked as a, a, a social media monitor, I'm a moderator. So you were so like, glad. if anybody's a moderator, reach out to us. We actually did get a response. She says she's not the raw data moderator, but when a moderator finds something interesting that belongs to federal employees, they send it to her. Okay, so she is involved just to, for the from the federal federal point of view, right? So she looks into like hate speech, sexual harassment, things like that, and she agreed with what I said that you learn to compartmentalize. Or that's what the you only see. way you can do it. 
Yes. And she says that she thought we would find this funny, but when she described her job on a first date with her now boyfriend, he said, so basically you look at dick pics all day. Which uh, that if uh, at that moment, she, she, I hope she knew that this is the one that she needs to be Well, she with. said it's a running joke and that here they are two years later and when they meet after work, he'll ask how her dick pic day went. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see any good ones today? <laughs> oh, well, we'll uh, leave her anonymous, but thank you so much for that, for that feedback. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, having a conversation just about the what ifs and, as far as working that type of a job. So we really appreciate that feedback. Thank you for sharing. All right, Dylan. So that concludes our case on Billy Mansfield Jr. Yeah. Not a good guy. Uh, a, a t- a incredible shitbird. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like the whole family's just got some problems. There, I mean, it's almost uh, from a clinical point of view, it's almost fascinating just how this just continues through the generations, this type of behaviors. But gosh, you know, but obviously you want them to be stopped. Sooner rather, sooner rather than later. I mean, Heather, now there's a, a lot of stuff out there we need to get to watch. And I know you've been busy lately. We're packing the house up, moving it to storage, laying out logistics for the first leg of our true crime tour of America. And I cannot wait for that to start. But uh, there's uh, some good stuff out there to watch as far as true crime docs go. Like what? Now, Nurse Karen in our Discord uh, said she watched American Nightmare on net, the Netflix and she was like, oh, my God, this is just a crazy story. And so I started digging into it. I watched an episode or two. And I cannot believe what I'm seeing. I, did, I was not familiar with this case. Um, a, a girl is kidnapped or reportedly kidnapped. And obviously they're going to blame the boyfriend or spouse, you know, from the get-go. And then it becomes almost like a uh, like a Gone, go- gone Girl type of storyline, right? Yeah, she shows back up. They're still not believing that she was kidnapped. They're, you know, putting everything on the boyfriend or her spouse. And it's just, I've got to get back into that because I've got to see how it works out. It is insane. So American Nightmare, Netflix, it looks like a crazy watch. Check it out if you have not. And we'll discuss some other time. There is another season of the Natalia Grace with the Curious Case of Natalia Grace on HBO Max. I have to watch that. A lot of people have been um, interested in that because it talks about her captivating adoption case and her life today. So I know that's another big true crime doc series that's out. Now, when you first mentioned this to me, I, I got it across. I didn't realize it's just a second season to what I'd already watched. Natalia yes. Speaks, I think is what it's called. And uh, I was fascinated. Heather, Heather didn't catch it with me, but I was just blown away. Everything I thought I knew about that case turned on its head watching the first season. So if you haven't watched that, check it out. It's just, uh, oh, man, it'll blow your mind. There is also the show that will be premiering on Netflix February 9th. It is called Lover, Stalker, Killer. It's taking a look at a a mechanic named Dave Krupa who connects with two women on a dating site. Um, I guess they meet at his auto body shop. They did not know, or I guess he didn't know, that this budding love triangle would turn deadly. So oh that gosh. sounds pretty interesting. And then on uh, CNN Films, it's a documentary from CNN Films and Max, um, they released Chowchilla, which explores the most bizarre kidnapping case of all time, a mass kidnapping in Chowchilla, California, when three masked men hijacked a school bus carrying 26 children. They demanded $5 million in ransom. And then they loaded them into soundproof vans, drove them into an underground bunker and buried them alive what you heard of this story the chowchilla dude this is a story that i remember from being a kid and like hearing about this story and it terrified me i have not heard of this before but now there is a uh, like a new documentary about it so you want to watch that well i'm going to check that out but that sounds really terrible and super scary absolutely then there is the daughters of the cult which is a five-part docuseries, and it gives firsthand accounts of from survivors and other witnesses. Um, they're going to reveal the story of a polygamous religious cult led by Prophet Ervil LeBaron, who's been nicknamed Mormon Manson. Oh, wow. He was known for mandating mass executions of his rivals. So that's kind of a wild 
case. It's going to um, be premiering on Hulu. And then, of course, a lot of people are interested in the Gypsy Rose Blanchard story. And there is a six-part Lifetime docuseries um, released uh, where she candidly shares her story. There's tell-all interviews. There, some of them are conducted before her release from prison. So a lot of interesting true crime docs out right now. I'm going to go dig into one of them. And we'd like to thank Erica again for sp sponsoring today's show by being so generous and donating over there on patreon.com forward slash mountain murders podcast. And uh, we really hope she enjoys all the ad free and extra content. Well, Dylan, you know what time it is? <laughs> What? A true detective time. Okay. So oh, we gotta we gotta wrap it up. My gosh. The new episode of True Detective season four is out. Holy and I cow. know what I'm doing, so I gotta get off here. Yeah, and after the third episode, we still don't know what the hell's going I on. I gotta get off. All right, let's go watch it. All right. We hope you all have a great week. We'll be back on Wednesday with a midweek. And uh, we will be dropping a Haunted Castle episode on Patreon this week yes. for our subscribers there. Dylan, I hope that you have a, a lovely day. I hope you do as well. Bye. You're Peace out. <laughs> Bye.